I'm James Beckwith, President and CEO of Five Star Bank. As a community bank, we believe that open dialogue about the issues affecting our region is vitally important. From the economy, to the environment, to social issues, we look forward to the conversations and hope you'll join in. Welcome to Studio Sacramento. I'm your host, Scott Syfax. As we launch this new series, we're looking forward to the stories ahead. However, as we all know, all good things must come to an end. This is the concept behind our conversation today. It's called The Exit Interview, and it's with one of our region's foremost educational leaders. Carl Toby Oxholm is the founding dean of Drexel University's Graduate School here in Sacramento and came to this region in 2006 with his wife Kim and quickly established himself as a change agent, always advocating for Drexel's presence in Sacramento while challenging its longtime residents to think of Sacramento not only as it is today, but its potential for tomorrow. Toby and Kim will be leaving us to become the president of Arcadia University in Glenside, Pennsylvania. This exit interview is the opportunity for Toby to give us his thoughts, observations, criticisms, and hopefully his insights on his time in the Sacramento region. And it's our opportunity to ask the questions that we've held back on before. Questions that we may have been too polite to ask, or questions where we really haven't wanted to know the answer. Regardless, this is our final chance, before we say our goodbyes, to have a conversation that matters. Welcome, Toby Hogsall. Thank you, Scott. It's great to be back here in KVIE, and thanks for all the good work you do for the region. Well, thank you. Well, Toby, I want to start off with something back from when you first arrived in 2008. You gave an interview where you were asked, why on earth would a Philadelphia university come to Sacramento? And your answer was, it's a great town and a perfect fit. In 2011, how would your answer change? It's a greater town and a perfect fit. Uh, this is a wonderful place to be, and Kim and I have had a wonderful time here. Drexel has grown phenomenally. We're now, we've gone from 53 students, from zero mm -hmm. to 53 to over 400. Uh, and with the exception of uh, a, a little bit of rain we've had this past couple weeks, it's been magnificent blue skies the whole time. So this is a great place to be. I think uh, the region's getting itself together, and we're proud to be part of it. How do you think we've changed since your arrival? We've had... Uh, Every, every single month we've been here, since mm -hmm. Drexel made the decision uh, to come to Sacramento, there have been job losses. That's a change. Um, there have been significant economic problems with the region. That's been a change. Um, but what also has been happening, I think, is people have begun to rally around um, initiatives coming together. Mayor Johnson's done a very good job trying to keep the kings here, excite people about the new arena, give a vision for the future. Township 9 that you've been working on has been a great, uh, great addition to the region. And we have a lot more enthusiasm for what's going on with the biotech and medtech from Sarda and UC Davis and others. It's an exciting time to be here. Uh, so the economy has been terrible, uh, but the spirit of the people is fantastic. And I think it's that spirit that's going to carry this region towards a great future. Well, that's hopeful news. And speaking of that spirit, in that same interview, you stated that Drexel was trying to attract the future leaders to this economy and looking for the next generation of Sacramento leadership. Our question is, did you find them? And if you did, how does their emergence on the Sacramento stage, how does it impact this region, and what do you think it means for our future? Um, that, that was our idea coming here, but it mm -hmm. wasn't original to Drexel. We did not come out here saying, we're going to make leaders. Mm -hmm. It really came as a result of the discussions I had with business CEOs and CFOs and board chair men and women mm -hmm. about the future of the region and, and what they thought was going to be there and how Drexel could fit in. Mm -hmm. And what I heard from for-profits and non-profits in the government sector mm -hmm. was that there wasn't much succession planning going on, mm -hmm. that the region was being run by boomers, and they were going to get ready to head to Tahoe or Napa within a couple years. Now, that time frame has changed a bit. Uh, it's been delayed for many people. Uh, but the idea is still there, that there's an enormous amount of opportunity waiting for those who see the future and are willing to put in the time to burnish themselves and their talents so that when the economy returns and the boomers leave, they'll be ready to take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. We have attracted those. We've, we've gotten f over 420 of those, and we're recruiting for another 100 this coming September. So when we're doing you, very well. When you hear their stories, Toby, because you, uh, 
take a unusually active role in getting to know and supporting your students through the Graduate Center. What are the stories that you hear where you get a common theme or, 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 or common thread that talks about where it is that you think that the promise of this region is going to be? That, that's an interesting one. Uh, the, w we teach working professionals. Mm -hmm. And most of our uh, programs so far have been offered in the evenings during the week. We're now doing more weekends to fit the needs of the working professionals. Um, but these are people who um, have kids at home or elderly parents. Right. Uh, they're in businesses where there have been rifts or job losses, so the numbers of people below them has changed. Mm -hmm. They're not sure whether they're going to have a job in two years. Mm -hmm. They're not sure whether they'll have, you know, what's going on with their housing, whether they can afford things. Their flexible income has gone down. They've been laid off or they've gotten furlough Friday. Throughout all of that, which would give any reasonable person the many opportunities to say, I'm out of here, I'm done with this. They've kept on. I am enormously, I have enormous pride and I'm enormously grateful for the students who have, despite all of that, all that the worst that California's economy can throw at them, they have stuck through it and we just, just on June 25th at the Crocker, graduated 107, 108 students mm -hmm. with master's degrees and certificates because they made it through. Now, that's the kind of spirit that founded this state and Sacramento. So you would say to all of the naysayers and the people who are down on Sacramento today, what would be your message to them? I'd say stop looking backwards. I mean, I think, this, I think the, the region's really, I hate using this word, but it, a phrase, it is. It's at a tipping point. Mm -hmm. It can either continue to be the government town or the cow town or the 90 miles from town, or it can recognize what it has, an enormous array of innovators and services and natural beauty and agriculture and access to and draw from that outsiders coming here, it takes a nanosecond to see. That's a, you're, you're giving us an interesting perspective because it almost sounds, and, and I want to make sure that I'm hearing this right, that you're saying stop trying to be Portland or San Francisco or L.A., You've got enough. You're enough all by yourself. You just need to kind of recognize it and realize that, sort of like Dorothy, there's no place like home. I did like that movie. That was a very good movie. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that's true. Listen, uh -huh. my, my wife and I have been living at 18th and L. Mm -hmm. um, we, we have restaurants everywhere. We have um, celebrations and craft sh uh, shops. I can walk to work. We can get on our bikes, and, and we can bike on streets where you're not a target, Right? right? You actually have right of way, uh -huh. and, and, and the cars allow you to cross streets without aiming for you. I mean, this is different from Philly. And in six blocks, you're on a pathway that takes you to the Jedediah Smith Trail, where you can be 36 miles and go up to a, a, a beautiful scenery all along the way. Tell me some other place where you can get that. I, you can't. I, I, mean, I don't know of it. But even if there's another, my goodness, how special this place is. Well, you know, <clears throat> in talking about how special this place is, it reminds me of something else that I've heard you speak of before. And that is about the great cities have great universities. And, you know, when, we, when Drexel first came to town, it um, was originally slated long term to be out uh, in a more rural area. But just talking generally, what, what would you see, what could you envision as, as the possibilities for bringing university life to the central city? Your viewers, your viewers ought to realize that Drexel has been uh, in downtown Philadelphia since its founding in, in, in 1891. So it's been there a long time. And it's been a gritty school. Its students take the subways. They work uh, in the for-profits and non-profits. They live in the neighborhoods. They have to learn how to be citizens. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what uh, higher education does is teach citizenship and how you deal with differences and how you integrate into the community and how you support it and how, uh, how educated people have the opportunity and the ability and we think at Drexel the duty to give back to their communities. So it's a vibrant part. Nonprofit, private education is a vibrant part of the investment strategy in a region. So walk, walk downtown. 
Okay. Walk on K Street, a beautiful street, right? It's got all the trees and the bricks, and what's on it? Not what it could be. At the end is a mall that's half empty. Right. But if you think about it, why couldn't a university be there? I mean, seriously, universities these days, you don't tra you teach too much under trees. You're using high tech, which requires dark rooms so you can beam the stuff onto the boards, use the smart boards, and, you know, teleport people into your classrooms. So you don't need windows. You can do it inside of a, a, a commercial shell. And then in the, if the students um, aren't in class, they're spilling out and going to stores to buy things or restaurants to have food. Um, the bus terminal, it's going to be what in a couple weeks? How about a student center? Sure. And, and the Marshall. Um, you've got a beautiful old, but maybe brand new, dormitory for students. And you know, students are the type of urban pioneers that usually will help populate and animate a place that needs to be reclaimed for the community, right? Well, I don't know about the urban pioneers part, but they don't sleep, you know, when I sleep, so right. they're up. <laughs> um, they have disposable income because right. their parents have given them way too much money as far as I'm concerned. Um, they like exploring, and they really don't have the same sense of caution, so they have a sense of liveliness and life. And when you have that kind of boppy time, merchants come to be with them. So they're, you know, Mermaids are great. Nothing wrong with mermaids. Right. Uh, but my sense is if you were to have a college in downtown Sacramento, you would have a lot of people coming for the arts and culture that come because we do presentations and our students do drama and, and music. Um, there will be lectures. Um, the two round convening areas inside the mall become gathering places where people can be on two decks and listen to a speaker. You can have shows. Then all of a sudden people who are now going down to 18th and L uh, for, you know, the second Saturday, start coming down to the mall to find out who's giving the talk uh, in, under the rotunda. It's a different kind of lifestyle uh, that attracts not just the undergrads and not just their faculty and administrators, but the people who live in the region. And the speakers that come in to talk to our students are world class at any university. That's what we do. We bring knowledge to our students. The point, right? We can share that with the community. That's why there's an open door policy. So people in the community get to hear the same kind of state-of-the-art thinking from around the globe because we're bringing people in either personally or by high-def video conferencing, which is, of course, what Drexel's been doing the three years we've been here. So if you were king, do you have a preference where that campus would be for some sort of urban university? No. I, 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 uh, I, the, the point of being in an urban area for mm -hmm. Drexel right. um, is that our students get a classroom experience and a work experience. They do internships for six months usually paid for a poor for profit company, minimum wage, or volunteer for nonprofits or government service. We like them to have the ability to walk to those jobs or get there easily. Now, this is not um, a great uh, mass transit region of the country, but there's a lot of buses and light rail that can take our students from a downtown area accessible to the transportation to where the jobs are. Or they can walk mm -hmm. because there is enough. So I think when you're talking about location, you have to know the mission of the school and what are they looking for? Because mm -hmm. our students work. Another university may be heavily in, into arts or science and want to be closer to places that are in the region that aren't downtown. Mm -hmm. let's, uh, let's talk a little bit broader. What are the other big opportunities that you, in your time in Sacramento, see that are ripe for being exploited? Whether it's in arts, culture, economics, business, what do you see are the big opportunities that maybe we're missing? I'll give you a, a Philadelphian's response, because in so many ways, this town is just like Philly, only 15 years behind. To give you an example, we, um, our mayor in 1976 bricked over our major commercial street, uh -huh. and it became K Street. It killed every business on it, and so now we've opened it up to traffic. Okay, <laughs> so, you know, we built I-95 right between us and the waterfront. Welcome, you know, there's I-5. It's the same kind of place. Um, what, we have history. We have the, this is where the Declaration of Independence was signed and the first Congresses were coming. But we found out that history doesn't sell everything. It's a good draw, but people will come and leave. So you've got to have more that sustains us. And in Philadelphia, we've gone to eds and meds, education and medicine. Look what we have here. We have huge state-of-the-art medicine, telemedicine, training the doctors of tomorrow in a region that's both, both urban and rural surrounded by agriculture that would, is the 
delight of the country. Breadbasket of the world. Uh, incredible, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and we're doing all the things in biotech and agricultural tech and med tech and innovation, which comes from higher education. That's what we do. We are creators. We do pressing the envelope, experimenting, bringing new things, applying it to what's there, coming up with new products. That's the future of the economy. And it's all right here. They just have to be put together. So if, you, if the state defunds UC Davis, you're putting a spike through the heart of the region. Sure. You just are, which is why I've been so vocal in favor of funding UC Davis, because that's where so many things come to light, new technologies, new jobs, new businesses. And the health system around here is superb. They need some help. But putting them together with a vibrant uh, uh, educational sector, that's going to work. So would you say is that <clears throat> the region taking for granted some of it, the jewels it has? Or is that just that the leadership is focused on other things? Um, look, it's really hard. It's, I think it's, it's too much to ask for mm -hmm. a government town that is focused on $22 billion of deficits mm -hmm. and furlough Fridays and, and small businesses closing because there's no uh, foot traffic and so many people being lobbyists that come and go. Um, it's really hard to focus on what its own strengths are. Now, I give Mayor Johnson enormous credit. You know, he's a basketball player. He's a point guard. He's got sharp elbows. And I think this town uh, doesn't give him enough credit because, you know, for political acumen, he's a point guard. He takes a lot of shots. He takes a lot of shots, but he's running everywhere fast. Mm -hmm. And he gets more attention and more assets and more people coming together than anyone I have met. You miss 100% of the shots you don't take, right? Um, yeah, absolutely. And any innovator will tell you you're not going to score 100% of the time. That's if you're right. going to be innovation... If that's going to be what drives this, this region's future, mm -hmm. you've got to try a few things. You've got to stick to it, run the plan, see how well you do, and a lot of them will hit. And I think uh, Mayor Johnson's done a great job on that. Mm -hmm. Let, let's turn the tables a little bit. What's been your greatest disappointment since you've been in the region? The greatest disappointment? Hmm... If I don't answer something, is that an indication? <laughs> uh, my greatest disappointment. All right. Um, so here's a disappointment. Um, when we came here, I came here from, from a place where employers partner with their employees to help. They invest in their employees, and they grow them by giving them tuition assistance, tuition reimbursement for education. It can be for a, um, a skill. Mm -hmm. It can be for a high school, a GED. It can go for, uh, you know, a certificate. It can go for college or graduate school, whatever. But employers will help the employee get there. Mm -hmm. And usually what they'll require is some kind of sweat equity. They'll say, I'll pay for it now. But it, and if you're here two years from now, it's forgiven because I would have gotten the benefit back for two years. It's a good thing for me. But if you leave before you, for the two years, you pay it back. Sweat equity, right? So the first thing I did was put that kind of form up on our website for any employer to use for any kind of employment, any kind of person seeking uh, 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 education. Employers here don't do it. They just don't do it. They will buy new equipment, but they won't invest in their human capital. I don't get that. They, they're worried that the people will leave. Well, shoot, you don't invest in them. Of course they're going to leave. You've got to have trust in people. If you trust in people and invest in people, they become loyal, they give you their discretionary time, and you get more than 100% out of their time, not less. But businesses here, they're reduced, the ones that have it, are reducing their investment in education, and they're not expanding it. And, and what's the implication of that, Toby? That you're never going to be spiraling up. You, you, people are not going to reach their potential without feeling loved and without being supported and without being given this, the, uh, the opportunity to be the best they can be. Mm -hmm. Now, they can do it at work. They can be given new assignments. But if they're on their way up and they're going to be directing the future of the business, they need to know best practices of the industry and of smart-thinking people with critical uh, uh, analytic skills, presentation skills, strategic planning skills. They have to be critical thinkers. They have to be able to negotiate their way through ambiguity, and not be upset when they hit the wall. They've got to figure their way around the wall. They've got to solve problems in a new way. We are training people in academia today for jobs that don't exist. We're not training them for jobs. Well, some do. Community colleges are geared to certain things. Right. But in the nonprofit, comprehensive, nationally ranked universities like Drexel and places like UC Davis, we are trying to inspire people, give them the skills they need to solve problems they haven't faced yet right. so they can be prepared. That's a mindset. And, and, and tell us, in, in the world economy, 
that we are very much a part of, why are those particular skills and attributes so critical to being able to effectively compete? Well, it seems to me that we have managed to ship offshore an awful lot of things. Um, and we've shipped out of California a lot of the brain power because the taxes are too high or the supports aren't large enough. So it's not just to other countries, it's to other states. I think the way we're going to recapture our dominance and protect our nation's security is by bringing back um, into our classrooms, into our graduate schools, STEM education, science, technology, engineering, math. It's hard, but st when they're young, kids don't know it's hard. It's computer games. It's all computer. And if you think about it, everything they do is a huge labyrinth and maze that's three-dimensional. It's not just this getting to there. It's time. It's dimension. When, when are the, we have to push this in order to open that door, and you have to go back three pages to get to here. I can't do that stuff. That is hugely technological. And all they have to do is get inside the machine to figure out the zeros and ones work mm -hmm. and understand the science behind it and get captivated by the molecular. That's where it's coming from. We have so many kids who are growing up at ease with technology, we just have to make them understand that that work, those jobs, are fun. And we can do that. I, I think the, the new powerhouse science center is going to be just like that. Exploratorium right here on the river, teaching kids that what they can do for environment and science and space is just what they're doing on their laptops and their, in their cell phones and their iPhones and their iTunes. It's going to happen. And that's why I think this region has what it takes. Well, let, let's talk about that for a second because uh, I, I hear your clarion call for STEM-related education loud and clear. At the same time, there's been a lot of commentary that well, we as an educational system, both K-12 through and higher education, are so focused on sort of the, the rote, mechanical, um, hard science piece of the equation that we're missing what are some of the more soft areas of education, the liberal arts, the the a higher level thinking and critical analysis. Uh, are, are you saying that there has been too much of an emphasis in that area? Or is there a blend that you think that is optimal for us being able to regain our competitive position? Not every student, not every person mm -hmm. learns the same way. Not every person is going to have the same interests or attributes or uh, abilities. What's really wonderful about this region that I did not find uh, back east um, and so it's a wonderful surprise to get here, is the degree of regional cooperation. Um, so we have SACOG, the Sacramento Area Council of Governments, and they had the plan for prosperity. And we have, we're getting together on transportation issues. And the blueprint. And the blueprint. Right. And now we have LEAD, linking uh, education with economic development. It's become a P20, uh, pre-kindergarten to 20th grade, collecting all of the educational uh, attributes around and creating different pathways to get to success. Recognizing that not, not every kid should go to college and college shouldn't be the criterion for success. But getting them into academies so they can go into healthcare and they can work um, maintenance in healthcare, they can be physician's assistants, or they can be molecular biologists or doctors or anything in between. Because there's a range of things. It's a continuum. It is a continuum. Mm -hmm. And as long as people feel valid and validated and respected in those careers, and success is getting through and getting their high school uh, degree certificate and going on getting a job in that field, that's huge for us. So I think actually all the, place, all the things are in place here for that regional cooperation, focusing on education with different pathways to success through LEAD and others, it's there. It just, the P20 was just formed this past spring. I was proud to be part of LEAD. Um, and I think it's going to be the direction of the future. We just have to support it, not just education. This is not an educational thing, okay? This is a community thing. It's a business investment strategy. So if everyone's waiting for academia to solve all the problems of the world, there's no money, we don't have it, and the interest is in the businesses and the people who live in the area because it affects the quality of life. The light bulbs are going on. It, it will change five years from now. This will be a totally different place. And it sounds like what you're saying is business, it's time to step up. Business, it's time to step up. Okay. All right. So, you know, as you handed off your baby at the, con <laughs> at the commencement ceremony that happened last Saturday, and you're making your transition over to Arcadia, Tell us, what was it that so excited you about the opportunity at Arcadia? Well, um, I've been in a academia for 10 years now, and I've had the privilege to work in a uh, phenomenal institution and watch Drexel grow over the 10 years. Um, and the opportunity to actually step up and go from senior vice president to becoming a president of a university 
uh, in the town where I spent most of my youth and most of my uh, uh, postgraduate um, uh, career is great. Both of our kids are there. Uh, Kim is very active in the community there and has remained so. Um, so it's a great place for us to go home. Um, but it's also, for me, liberal arts. I went to a liberal arts college. My life changed because I went to a liberal arts college. I became who I am today because of the pulling and the pushing and the prodding and the challenging and the personal attention that my professors gave me and the opportunities that I had for sports and after school activities and public service. So the idea that I could go back and give back uh, to an institution that is devoted to liberal arts, creating creative thinkers, critical thinkers, mm -hmm. um, to me is fantastic. Well, that is wonderful. And that, we're about out of time. I would like to thank our guest, Toby Oxholm, the outgoing dean of Drexel University, and the incoming president of Arcadia University. We wish you and Kim well and hope that both of you will not be strangers. That's our show for today. You've been watching Studio Sacramento with me, Scott Syfax. Keep the conversation going with your friends and family. We'll be back next time to start another conversation right here on KBIE. I'm James Beckwith, President and CEO of Five Star Bank. As a community bank, we believe that open dialogue about the issues affecting our region is vitally important. From the economy to the environment to social issues, we look forward to the conversations and hope you'll join in.